OK. I was actually told that some of you have difficulty seeing the blackboard from the back. I don't think there is a solution for this problem unless we tear down the, uh, the pillar at the center. So uh, you probably have to just move uh, when I move uh, across the blackboard. Sorry about that, yeah. All right, so um, let me actually start, continue the lecture by starting from the question that was asked uh, about the phase transitions. Where are you? Oh, you're there in the back. Sorry, yes. So um, uh, that was a very interesting question for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the reasons is that uh, I hope I'll have a time to give you a, a brief description of my own research. And my own research is heavily based on uh, searching for phase transition. So I'm actually happy that this question has been, uh, has been raised. Uh, the other reason is that this is actually uh, one of the motivations uh, behind the development of uh, this category of tools, uh, which is now considered as one big category, that these tools uh, that allow you to go beyond the uh, microcanonical ensemble. Not, I mean, saying that phase transitions don't take place in the microcanonical ensemble is not correct, obviously, for a number of reasons. I mean, um, so the question, I guess, uh, that was asked is, uh, suppose, let me, I mean, use again the example of uh, water. Uh, you want to study freezing of water, OK? Can you do it with an MVE uh, simulation? Well, you know. It's uh, in NVE, you set your conditions. And so you suppose you start from the fluid. You start with some configurations. And at some point, you will equilibrate. And let's assume that your equilibration will be uh, 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 is done in a way that you reach uh, a given temperature, which is still a uh, temperature that, for which you are in the liquid. Uh, at that point, uh, of course, the system, no phase transition will take place because you have defined your uh, thermodynamic conditions. So in order to see phase transitions, you have to change your thermodynamic transitions. For example, you may wish to lower the temperature. Now, lowering temperature is something that I've, we've just seen cannot be done straight, in a straightforward way directly in the microcanonical ensemble. So then you will have to consider using the canonical ensemble that is introducing, for example, the special thermostat called Z thermostat and playing with this target temperature, for example, by setting the target temperature initially to a value in which you know that water is uh, liquid, and then slowly decreasing this target temperature, hoping that the system will eventually uh, solidify and freeze and lead you to, uh, uh, to, to ice. Uh, now, uh, there are a number of problems when you do this. Uh, one problem is the fact that uh, freezing, as, as well as any phase transition in condensed matter systems, or almost every uh, phase transition in condensed matter systems uh, involves uh, a density change. And uh, uh, immediately see that, uh, uh, although we never talked about uh, the volume variable, there is volume here. And when I say NVE, of course, I mean that the volume is fixed. And in fact, if you think about the scheme that we've uh, discussed so far, it implies that you have a given simulation box, a cube, whose boundaries are fixed, because you have to be able to determine interactions with the nearest neighbors. So when I say NVE, I mean the volume is fixed, is determined by the box uh, the, where the simulation takes place. So if, if there is a phase transition, there is a change of density. In the case of ice, it's not that big, right? It's slight expansion. But it still means that whatever you will obtain if it freezes is not ice at zero pressure. Because if you started with the volume of water which corresponded to zero pressure, you freeze it, you, re you keep the same density, you will find that ice has a positive pressure when it freezes. So is this a correct treatment of a phase transition? Phase transitions take place when the thermodynamic conditions change when you apply pressure and temperature, not when you keep the volume constrained. So this is one problem. Um, uh, the other problem, of course, uh, is that uh, phase transitions uh, have this uh, very nasty property that uh, in most cases they take place through nucleation, right? 90% um, of the phase transitions that take place in, in solids uh, take place through nucleation. And nucleation, as you probably know, is a very rare process, right? Uh, we can simulate uh, picoseconds, uh, nanoseconds, perhaps in some cases microseconds, and we can simulate systems that can be a thousand, a million, a billion particles. Well, hoping that the correct fluctuation takes place in your system and that this, uh, the system will actually freeze, well, depends on this kind of system you've chosen. And it can actually, in some cases, be something that will never take place. 
That is, you start cooling down water and you will see that water stays fluid, uh, undercooled down to temperatures which are much, much below uh, zero centigrades. Okay, so there are actually two problems when you study phase transition. One is that uh, working with NVE is not the appropriate uh, way to deal with the problem. And the second problem is that in most cases, phase transition tend to be uh, 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 driven, start from rare events. Okay, now um, let me just briefly describe uh, the, uh, how to go beyond uh, the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, in the case of temperature, we've already seen a simple way to go beyond uh, the microcanonical ensemble. We have seen a method that essentially allows us to work with a canonical ensemble, which is N, V, and T, right, in thermodynamic uh, terms. So the question now is, can we go beyond this and do perhaps uh, N, P, T, for example? That would solve at least the problem of dealing with the change in density, which is one of the problems you're facing when you study a phase transition. Now, it turns out that there are actually methods that, uh, that uh, allow you to go beyond the, uh, uh, the, the fixed volume uh, technique. And of course, they involve changing the volume, precisely like uh, in the case of the thermostat, they involve changing the energy through this friction term in such a way that the temperature is conserved. Okay? Similarly, in the case of the volume variable, you want to allow the volume to change in such a way that pressure is the thermodynamic variable that uh, your system uh, satisfies. That is, your system is equilibrated at a given pressure, and the volume has to adjust to the corresponding uh, pressure. So the first thing you have to allow, of course, is to, for your box uh, to change at least volume. So if you have a box with periodic boundary conditions, well, you have to allow your box to change uh, its, uh, 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 I mean, cell parameters, the cell parameters of the unit cell, in order to allow some uh, volume fluctuations. In the simplest possible way, you may just wish to allow your box to change uh, isotropically. Mm? This is called Anderson uh, dynamics. I'm not going to write down the equations because it will take too much time, but you may immediately see that equations are going to be very similar to this one, except that uh, the variable is going to be coupled not to the velocities, but it's going to be coupled to the uh, unit cells of the cell, because those are the ones you want to change in order to allow a phase transition. And the other difference is that instead of having here an imbalance between the temperatures, you will have an imbalance between the instantaneous pressure that the system has at a given volume that you can calculate using various theorem or other methods, and the target pressure that you want to, uh, that you want to achieve. So if you do all this uh, properly, right, in a, in a methodology which is actually that was developed by, uh, initially that was developed by um, Parinello and Raman. Let me mention those names. Uh, so the NPT techniques in, uh, in uh, molecular dynamics was really first uh, uh, introduced by Michele Parinello and uh, Anis Raman. Michele Parinello is going to give a colloquium uh, uh, this week, next week? Next week, okay. And so their method is essentially based on uh, something, I mean, a new variables that couple to the strained degrees of freedom of the unit cell and where the, uh, the, the, the unbalance is between the instantaneously calculated pressure and the target pressure. So if you want to freeze water, you do a simulation in which you both change, you can change the temperature using thermostat, you keep pressure constant, uh, say zero or whatever, I mean one atmosphere, which is essentially zero in the scale of uh, atomic systems. And then you let the system cool down, and at least uh, the density part is taken care of. That is, if the system wants to freeze and wants to expand, the, the, the cell will adapt in such a way that the pressure remains constant to uh, one atmosphere during the simulation. Right? So essentially, the same methodologies that we use to, uh, to keep temperature fixed can also be extended to, uh, and has been extended by Pernel Raman, to uh, deal with uh, 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 pressure that is to change from NVT to NPT. This, of course, doesn't yet solve the problem of uh, the second problem I mentioned, namely the fact that nucleation is a rare event. So you have to wait until, uh, 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 at some point inside the sample, uh, the, uh, the, the crystallization, the transition to ice uh, starts, and this takes place to nucleation. The time scales for that can be uh, extremely long. Now, this opens now a completely uh, new, I mean, uh, uh, subject uh, within molecular dynamics that I was not planning to cover. Uh, is anybody going to cover? Uh, mm, okay. Which is the topic of advanced sampling techniques. Uh, 
Molecular dynamics, as you might uh, imagine, is a very uh, stupid way of exploring phase space in a statistical system. In fact, uh, it's a very efficient way as long as you are limited to work around the well-defined minimum of the potential energy. But as soon as you have to jump from one uh, I mean, basing of the potential energy surface to another basing of the potential energy surface, and the transition uh, has to take place through an energy barrier, so it's a rare event, then molecular dynamics uh, becomes less effective, of course, unless uh, you devise ways to uh, uh, accelerate uh, these uh, special transitions through special paths to uh, different uh, basings of the uh, potential energy surface. I have to mention that in this respect, uh, Monte Carlo is sometimes to be preferred, at least uh, if you use molecular dynamics in a blind way without this uh, advanced uh, statistical uh, uh, sampling uh, additional methodology. So Monte Carlo, whenever you have uh, uh, problems dealing with uh, large energy barriers and nucleation, for example, rare events, uh, sometimes Monte Carlo is more efficient because Monte Carlo, you can tune your, st your, your moves in such a way uh, to be more efficient in your exploration of the phase space. While with molecular dynamics, uh, you are limited by the real dynamics uh, of your uh, Newton's equations in the exploration of your system. Unless, of course, uh, you introduce some additional uh, forces that force you away from the, uh, from the basing, from the basing of attraction where you are uh, located. And this can be done in a variety of different ways. Uh, there is, for example, a very interesting technique that was developed recently, actually, uh, by Parinello again and people here at CISA, which is called metadynamics, which is essentially based uh, on, uh, I mean, there are thousands of these techniques. I'm just mentioning one. Uh, this technique is very interesting because it's based on the dynamics in which uh, every time you, with your molecular dynamics, you explore your phase space, uh, you leave a barrier behind you. You leave some, 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 uh, you increase the potential behind you, essentially. So next time you come back to that point, you will be repelled because you left behind this potential energy barrier behind you. So essentially, this encourages you to explore a region of the phase space, uh, always new region of the phase space. Never go back to where, to places that you've already explored, which is typically the case when you sample a, a, a given basing of attraction. At some point, after you fill the entire space around this basing of attraction, you'll be forced to jump out of that basing and explore new territories. Okay, so that's the spirit of metadynamics. There are again thousands of different ways to uh, enhance uh, molecular dynamics to uh, allow molecular dynamics to explore uh, rare events. Uh, I'm not going to discuss them because it would take me at least uh, uh, a few hours to enter into this state state. So anyway, phase transition, I hope this is an answer that allowed me to introduce also uh, different uh, ensembles like NPT in addition to NVT, and also it allowed me to mention the issue of uh, advanced statistical samplings in the framework of uh, uh, molecular dynamics. Okay, now let me uh, finally go to the, um, to the, um, the second part of my lecture, which is the one dealing with, uh, if you remember, at the beginning we mentioned this, uh, our problem was uh, to solve, uh, to integrate, uh, uh, pop, 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 Rn, and we assumed that uh, 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 the potential, that is the force, uh, was provided to us by some black box, a subroutine or something. Okay. So now, the second part of the lecture, I'm going to discuss uh, how to actually calculate this potential of interaction between particles. Hmm? Now, this I, I will take a sort of a historical approach to this, right? It's, which is not probably a, a pedagogically uh, the best one, but it's actually useful because it allows me to uh, get to the final part, which is uh, the ab initio molecular dynamics, which I will I hope I will have just uh, the chance to uh, mention even for a few minutes. Okay, so let me uh, uh, now rewind, and we go back to the 60s, actually to the 50s. Uh, in fact, uh, you've probably seen some of these uh, papers listed in Antonello's uh, introduction. Some of them were actually <coughs> dealt with uh, the beginning of molecular dynamics, where people were using the first computers, and therefore they were bound to use extremely simple functional forms for this potential of interaction. Right? So if your goal is to simulate uh, a liquid, for example, a simple liquid, you have some uh, particles which are the particles composing your liquid, and you want to come up with a very simple expression for the force acting on particle I, or 
if you wish, of the potential of interaction between particle I and all the other particles of the system. Now, the simplest way to, uh, to write down an interaction between a particle and another one, that is to write down this V, is to say that this is uh, a sum of uh, pair interactions. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, one half, sum I different from J of uh, some phi, which I call pair of interaction with par between particle I and particle J. For example, when you're studying phonons in solids, that's exactly the approximation you're using. You're assuming that each particle is there interacting through springs with, uh, with nearest neighbors. Okay? Uh, in a more complex system, in a fluid, this potential of interaction between two particles uh, is going to be a bit more complex. In fact, it's not difficult to come up with some simple form, at least the shape of this curve, uh, of this uh, phi 2, I guess, right? Uh, so this, this, this curve has a sort of universal form. Now, this is the interaction between two particles. So at long distances, it has to go to zero. There is always... Uh, Unless the particles are charged, let me forget about charged particles. Let's assume that the particles are neutral. At long distances, if particles are neutral, they will interact with something which is uh, minus r to the 6. OK? Dispersion forces at long distances between. It's the last contribution to the interaction, the longest lasting interaction between two neutral particles, r to the 6, negative. At short distances, they will have to repel each other, clearly because of a number of reasons, right? Pauli exclusion principle, nuclei, and all that. I mean, that two atoms don't like to uh, stick to one another, I mean, to, to get too much close to one another. Well, what remains is just analytical extrapolation. And so what you're left with is some depth and some typical distance, sigma, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, equilibrium between two particles, right? I'm saying something which is probably trivial to everyone, right? Simple uh, <coughs> chemistry 101. I mean, this is a generic interaction between two neutral particles. Now, it turns out that uh, I think 99% of the, the elements in the periodic table, for example, if you take uh, the interaction between two arbitrary pairs, they behave in this way, qualitatively. Of course, they will differ in terms of uh, depth of the interaction. For a covalent bond, the depth will be huge. For, uh, say, rare gases, the interaction will be extremely small uh, for pairs of rare gases. They will differ in terms of the uh, 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 distance, equilibrium distance. For covalent bonds, the distance will be extremely short. For uh, dispersion interactions, the distance will be huge. Take two helium atoms, for example, the distance is, what, 100 angstroms? Where are the QMC people here? I don't see them. Anyway, it's about 100 angstroms, so the, the, the equilibrium interaction between two helium particles, right? Carbon carbon is one point something angstrom. So the distance and the depth will change, but the shape of the function will be more or less uh, the same, with very few exceptions between two arbitrary part, two arbitrary elements in the periodic table. Of course, this consideration has led people, scientists, particularly in the 60s and 50s, when they started to do molecular dynamics on very simple computers, to come out with some simple analytical forms for this uh, function. The most pro popular one is Leonard Jones. I guess you're all familiar with that, right? So there is an energy scale, and then there is a, um, there is a sigma over r, sigma r12 minus uh, sigma r to the 6. Okay, so that's a very simple form in terms of r. has the correct repulsion at short distances, has the correct, actually, even the correct power law at long distances. And this function has a minimum which is somewhere close to, the, to sigma, and a depth which is uh, something of the order of epsilon. Not exactly the same, but I mean, just numerical factors. So this is a very simple functional form you can easily use on a, every computer to uh, solve molecular dynamics in a very efficient way. Leonard Jones. And there are thousands, millions, zillions of different functional forms nowadays available of different sorts, uh, Born-Meyer, exponentials, blah, blah, blah. They all more or less give you this uh, qualitatively this sort of behavior with some little details that depend on the system. Okay? Uh, are, is this description enough to describe uh, a complex, uh, for example, fluid like this one? Well, you may argue, why not? I mean, after all, I'm interacting with uh, you, with you, with you, and I'm interacting independently with all of you, right? 
So why shouldn't this be enough or close to enough to describe the total potential of interaction between particles in, this, uh, in these systems? Well, let me show you an example in which is this is clearly not the case. Let me take two particles interacting with one another, I and J. Now, I'm sure you know chemistry, right? So I'm sure you know that if two particles are interacting, well, there will be some electronic charge accumulating somewhere, somewhere here, if this is the covalent bond, right? We all know that when the atoms are approaching, the electronic clouds are starting to do some business, right? Uh, chemistry. So, for example, there will be some sort of accumulation of uh, charge distribution uh, electrons here due to the fact that, for example, they're forming a covalent bond. Let me now imagine a, a third particle, K, coming closer to I and J, actually coming in between I and J. Now, obviously, from your chemistry, I mean, uh, uh, intuition, you can easily see that this particle K is going to affect dramatically the way I and J are interacting. If this particle, for example, likes to interact with I or with J, some of these electrons will immediately have to move and form a bond with K. All right? So the way I and J interact with one another, if you think about it in terms of chemistry, is strongly affected by any other atom present in the vicinity. If K is here or here or here or here, it will dramatically affect the way I and J bind. Well, dramatically. It will certainly affect it in some way, the way I and J will bind. Now, this, of course, in the, uh, in historically has always been, uh, well, historically, I mean, there was a time in which uh, people have approached this problem by expanding this to next order, that is, by introducing terms which uh, were of the kind uh, J different from K, of third order terms, right? R i, R j, R k. And hopefully these terms were correcting deficiencies of the uh, pair potential model. Now there again, in the literature you'll find uh, hundreds if not uh, thousands of different ways to describe uh, corrections to pair potentials due to uh, three body interactions. And you can go further. I mean, you can actually now say, well, if I have a fourth atom here, atom L, well, this is going to affect the way I, J, and K interact. Because, again, from a chemistry point of view, this is going to displace a little bit the electronic charge, and it's going to affect both this one and this one. So then, do I need a fourth? Well, of course. In fact, uh, there are cases in which, uh, I mean, it's actually rare to find a theory that uh, allows you to converge this series. Most theories based on these uh, n-body expansions uh, truncate uh, the expansion in an effective way. That is, if they were allowed to go to infinite terms, uh, they would actually diverge. The terms would actually diverge. Mm -hmm. So it's only through some renormalization that people are now able to uh, uh, include higher order terms in an effective way uh, in, uh, in uh, two and three, and three uh, body terms or two body terms in principle. Now, there is, of course, when people started to realize that this was a never-ending story, they started to uh, develop some more clever ways to describe interactions between atoms. And one very clever way to do that is instead of uh, adding third-order terms here, is to say that uh, the two-body part of the interaction depends in an effective way, for example, on some parameter, which I will call rho and j, which tells me what is the environment around myself. Okay? You can think of this, for example, as, for example, the total number of bonds that I'm forming in that particular moment. Uh, or you can think of it as more complex analytical forms that essentially look around myself and determine some average property of my environment. Uh, people have come up with some uh, power laws and complicated sums over the nearest neighbors. Uh, you can just think it in terms of number of nearest neighbors, for example, just to have a simple uh, picture of what this row could be. Mm? It could be more complex than that, but it could also be the number of nearest neighbors. That is, the interaction between myself and another particle depends not only on the distance, but also on how many nearest neighbors I have around myself as well as how many nearest neighbors the other particles has around itself. Hmm? So this is a way to effectively incorporate these three, four, and five body contributions to that. Uh, 
In fact, people sometimes call it uh, density, even if it's not actually a density. It's a single parameter that incorporates uh, some information about the environment I'm surrounded, uh, uh, that surrounds myself. Mm -hmm. And in general terms, this, these potentials go under the name of embedded atom potentials. They take different names. I just, just use a one very popular one. Because the, every atom is embedded in a neighbor, uh, in, the, in an environment which uh, you can characterize by a single parameter. And if, of course, uh, I mean, use your imagination and extend this to more than one parameter, there may be just more than one parameter that defines what is my environment, and so on and so forth. So these potentials tend to be quite, I mean, they can be actually quite uh, uh, sophisticated, uh, and you can, you can expand this into more parameters and to make it more and more um, accurate. I think this is the right time to uh, start talking about uh, uh, ab initio molecular dynamics, because this is actually the next step. The next step is to realize that when you do, if you were able to solve the entire electronic proper problem properly, you should be able to obtain this number, this quantity, this function here properly. So what is this function? Uh, what is this function in, uh, in a perspective in which uh, you go, I mean, above, I mean, to a theory which is, uh, which is above? What, what are we doing here? What are we trying to determine? We have, a, in principle, we have a, a set of uh, nuclei at position uh, i, j, and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to see now the problem from an ab initio perspective, right? So without having to derive the potential from some effective approximations. Let's try and introduce the potential and construct this potential entirely from first principles without introducing any, any empirical parameter, any approximation. What I should do in principle is to say that I have a given number of nuclei at those different positions. Of course, the nuclei will be different. They will have their own uh, uh, charge, right? If this is silicon, the charge here will be plus 14. If this is hydrogen, it will be plus 1. If this is carbon, it will be plus 6, and so on and so forth. Right? These are nuclei. Well, let me digress. Do I need to know more about the structure of the nucleus? Of course not. Right? Dynamics of the nucleus, the energy of the nucleus, is something that belongs to a completely different scale of energy and time scales. So as far as, as I'm concerned in condensed matter physics, here I'm only dealing with nuclei as objects with a mass and with, uh, with a charge with this, which is the atomic number of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the nucleus, essentially. Okay? I can forget about the internal dynamics of it. I hope this is clear, right? I mean, we're all physicists, so we know that there are different energy scales, and nuclear physics is, does not belong to this room, at the moment, at least. Okay, then I have electrons. Right? And electrons are, well, you know, to start with, uh, you can say I have Zj electrons surrounding my silicon. You have one electron surrounding my hydrogen. You have six electrons surrounding my carbon. Of course, in carbon, uh, two of them will belong to the core, the 1s electrons, and four electrons will belong to the valence. Similar for silicon, right? Out of 14 electrons, uh, 10 will belong to the core, and four will belong to the valence. Hydrogen, that electron is pretty free. So I can start to remove at least electrons in the core. If you know about, a little bit about chemistry, I mean, this is obvious. Uh, core electrons essentially stick to the core, and they are not relevant as far as bonding between atoms is concerned. In any way, this is just a detail. The important thing is that they have a number of electrons in this system. And I mean, the decision to place the electrons on top of each specific atom, of course, is no longer a good uh, way to proceed, because the atoms are no longer individual atoms in vacuum. They are now in a condensed system, right? So I shouldn't be talking about Zj electrons here, one electron here, six electrons here. I should be talking about the total number of electrons, which is the sum of all the electrons, placed somewhere here in the system. And in fact, what I should be looking for is the solution of the quantum mechanical problems for the electrons in the presence of Coulomb potentials centered in the vicinity of the, actually at the position of the nuclei. So if I'm an electron in this system, I'm seeing these uh, potential wells uh, due to the Coulomb attraction with the nuclei, but each electron will see all of them, right? It will not just see 
uh, actually electrons are indistinguishable particles. So there's no way I can tell whether I belong to, originally belonged to silicon or to hydrogen when the material was formed. So I have a number of electrons here, each one of them seeing this landscape of holes, uh, and, and, uh, and then I will have to find the ground state of this system. So this is a complicated problem. It's a many-body problem for the electrons. Fortunately, we have density functional theory, and I hope you'll see something about it uh, in, the next, uh, in the next days. I want to cut a long story short. At the end, you may or may not, depending on the level of approximation, come out with uh, a ground state, a wave function which describes the quantum behavior of your electrons. All right? Wave function, which will depend in a parametrical way on the position of the nuclei. Right? Because this wave function, which is the big wave function of the electrons, if I change the position of this uh, nucleus, the position of this uh, well will, will move, and therefore also my ground state wave function will have to change, will have to adapt to the new uh, landscape, to the new potential configuration. And of course, if I have a ground state wave function, I will also have a ground state uh, energy, which will be also, of course, uh, dependent on on the position of my nuclei. OK? Now, clearly, this energy is exactly the quantity I have to use uh, here. There's only a few things missing, such as the interaction between the nuclei, the Coulomb interaction between the nuclei. That's trivial, just Coulomb potential. But all the rest that is contained here in V is nothing but the ground state of uh, the electronic, uh, 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 the ground state of the, this many-body system of electrons uh, seeing this very complex potential of uh, uh, Coulomb, I mean, Coulomb attractions, Coulomb wells located at the position of the, of the nuclei. Mm -hmm. Now, in doing this, I made a very important approximation already. I mean, it sounds obvious to many of you, but it is an important approximation, which is the fact that uh, I've chosen the ground state for the electrons. In principle, when I do molecular dynamics, that is, when I start moving my nuclei, and let me now call them nuclei, because what I'm actually moving is the nuclei, not the electrons. The electrons move as a consequence of the nuclear motion. Uh, when I move my nuclei, I'm assuming that the electrons adiabatically adapt to the local ground state, to the instantaneous ground state that I have to determine every time the, the, the nuclei move. Because when the nuclei, nuclei move, this uh, Potential wells of attractions are also moving, and therefore the ground state wave function will change. And the assumption is that, and this is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation or adiabatic approximation, is that the electrons follow adiabatically in their ground state the motion of the nuclei. And of course, the adiabatic approximation is a result of the fact that the electronic mass is much lighter than the mass of the nuclei. So their dynamics is extremely fast compared to the scale of dynamics of the nuclei. By the time the uh, nuclei uh, uh, undergo one vibration in, in a molecule, for example, the electrons, the dynamics of the electrons, as uh, I mean, as seen, uh, circulation of the phase of the wave functions, at least, uh, uh, I mean, orders of magnitude faster than, uh, than the vibration of the, uh, of the nuclei in a system. So electrons are very fast. As a consequence of that, uh, I can use the Born-Oppenheimer approximation And I can say that this is actually the ground state wave function. And I can use the ground state energy of my quantum electron, I mean, I mean quantum n body uh, 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 n electron system to determine the potential of interaction for the nuclei. Mm -hmm. Now, the consequence of this, of course, now, if I do this, uh, I'm only making one approximation, which is the born oppenheimer approximation. If I accept this approximation, there's no parameter involved in my calculation. That is, the calculation is exact, right? The potential is exact. There is no further approximation in, in that, except the only one that I've introduced is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And of course, uh, be, be, before that, I mean, the assumption that the nuclei behave as classical objects. But if I accept that the class, nuclei are classical objects, I accept that they, uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, this potential is nothing but with some small corrections, Coulomb interaction, uh, 
is nothing but the ground state energy of the many body electron system for that particular choice of the position of the, of the nuclei. Which is, of course, as you probably all know, an unsolvable problem. Because solving the uh, many body uh, ground state of a system of even 10 electrons, 12 electrons, is already a challenge. Uh, not to mention, of course, a system which typically has at least 1,000 electrons. Because if you have 100 atoms, you typically have 1,000, 2,000, if not more. Uh, uh, electrons in your system. So no way you'll be able, ever able to determine this ground state uh, exactly or even approximately for a, for a realistic system, so you'll have to make some approximations. The most important one is the density functional theory. And don't ask me to go into the details of that because that will take me another hour. Just wanted to flesh some concepts that you will probably be seeing later on uh, during the school. Okay, so density functional theory is a very effective theory which allows you to recast the many body problem into a set of independent uh, one electron problems which can be solved effectively on a calculator nowadays. So it's a very powerful theory. Uh, it's in principle an exact theory uh, if we only knew the form of this functional. Right? Well, unfortunately, we don't know the form of the functional, so there are several approximations to that. So this is an approximated theory at the end of the day, just because we don't know what the exact functional is. Anyway, this is just to cut a long story short, that uh, you can calculate the uh, total energy of a system within some approximations, and that total energy enters here, and it's the potential that you're going to use uh, for the dynamics uh, uh, of your... Uh, of your um, um, for the molecular dynamics uh, of interest. This, if you're able to do that, of course, uh, you can completely forget about uh, all these kind of approximations. Just use that. That's much more accurate than any functional form expansion of your potential in terms of two or three or n-body uh, terms. Let me briefly um, uh, sketch some challenges uh, in, uh, uh, in doing this... Um, Molecular dynamics with an ab initio. I think it's my cell phone, which is coupling to this. Uh, let me just uh, mention a few challenges related to the uh, <clears throat> to the use of the uh, exact or ab initio potential in uh, molecular dynamics. Now. Um, Obviously, I mean, uh, the, uh, sorry, I should have kept this one. I have this uh, nuclei here. Um, I'm going to determine, suppose I'm able to determine the wave function. The wave function will be something like that, right, with some, uh, so electrons will be, uh, of course, they will accumulate primarily close to the nuclei because this is where the attractive potential is, right? So the electrons will accumulate close to the, to the nuclei, so I have some, approximate wave function uh, for the ground state, which, as I said, is a parametric form. So it depends parametrically on the value of the positions. And of course, as a consequence, I have an energy. Now, let me go back and consider this in the framework of molecular dynamics. Remember Verlet integration. So every time we integrate uh, with Verlet a molecular dynamic step, we are Guess we are extracting positions at time t plus delta t, okay? Which means uh, after a delta t, this particle will be slightly displaced, this one will be slightly displaced, this will be slightly displaced, and so on and so forth, right? Each particle will follow its own uh, displacement uh, due to the fact that we've integrated using Verlet uh, the dynamics uh, based on the force which I calculated using now the ab initio potential. But the bottom line is that now I have particles sitting at uh, different positions. And of course, I have to recalculate my ground state because now the nuclei are at different positions. I have to recalculate my ground state, recalculate my ground state energy. So you immediately see that they have to repeat this uh, 100,000 times or a million times. Uh, this is becoming a very serious problem, particularly if the system of interest contains uh, hundreds of particles. I first have to solve the quantum mechanical problem for several thousand electrons. Not only, but every step, I have to solve it again. And I have to repeat this exercise a million times. So ab initio molecular dynamics is indeed quite expensive in computational terms. 
There are some tricks, however, and some obvious tricks. And the most obvious one is that, uh, you know, if the atoms have changed their positions by only a little displacement, and typically displacement has to be small, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to integrate your molecular dynamics, well, then the potential seen by the electrons uh, with respect to the previous step uh, is not going to be changed uh, dramatically. It's just slightly changed. So the previous wave function is a very good guess for the solution of the new problem. That is, if we use uh, standard methods to find the ground state of a uh, function, I mean, uh, mm, well, there are several methods, but uh, most of them rely on an initial guess of what the wave function could be. For example, if you use a variational method, you need to start from some initial wave function. Now, the previous wave function obviously turns out to be extremely close if, of course, the displacement is uh, small. Okay? So, it is difficult, but it is not as difficult as you might imagine. For example, it is uh, less difficult than if, you had, uh, the, the, than if you were trying to do Monte Carlo with an ab initio potential. Because in Monte Carlo, the moves are much longer. Typically, the system changes quite substantially from one step to another one of a Monte Carlo uh, 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 procedure. In molecular dynamics, you're always assured that the positions are very close because you are integrating that in real time. You're solving a second order differential equation. Okay? So I'm just also highlighting some of the differences of molecular dynamics in Monte Carlo when you're using an ab initio potential. Uh, molecular dynamics is sometimes better because uh, it allows a quicker estimation of the, es of the energy after a time step, as opposed to Monte Carlo, where the step is, uh, is bigger. Which brings me to a very interesting method that was developed uh, more than 30 years uh, uh, here in Trieste, by the way, to make uh, this uh, uh, estimate even faster. Let me try to briefly describe this method. It's called the Carparinello method. Now, let me see. Let me first uh, draw this curve here. Suppose I fix the position of the nuclei, OK? The positions the nuclei are, in fixed, are fixed. And suppose that I now calculate uh, the energy of uh, my quantum mechanical state as a function of uh, the wave function itself. Mm? I can say, call energy psi h, let me put r1, uh, rn psi. Okay? If this is not yet the ground state, that is, if this is not yet uh, the, uh, the ground state wave function, this energy will depend on psi. And I can draw. Well, uh, this is an Hilbert space, so it's just, just one coordinate. It's an infinite, infinitely many coordinates, but let's try to condense everything into a single one, right? Well, this will have typically a nice parabolic form. Well, it is parabolic if you only have a psi and psi here. Unfortunately, in density functional theory, the Hamiltonian contains the density, all right? And the density is a function of the wave functions. So unfortunately, in density functional theory, this energy as a function of the wave function is not just a quadratic form. It's slightly uh, different with respect to a quadratic form. But let me assume that to first approximation, this is a quadratic form, and that you, in some way, are able to determine the ground state. Hmm? I'm now moving in the space of wave functions. This is the expectation value of the wave function of the Hamiltonian. That I want to work with, of which I want to determine the ground state. So this is the Hamiltonian that contains all these uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, holes uh, at the position of the nuclei. The nuclei are fixed. And I will find the, 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 ground, the, ground wave fun the ground state wave function in some way. Right? I can do a variational principle. Well, I can even, in principle, use stupid methods like conjugate gradients. I mean, some solvers for uh, quantum problems use conjugate gradients. They start from a given guess of the wave function, and then they uh, go down in steps until they reach down to the, uh, to the ground state, to the ground state, OK? So in other words, uh, there are some methods. I mean, there are plenty of methods to optimize a quantum problem. I don't want to go into the details of that. I just want to mention that they, they all start from a guess of the wave function, typically, 
and then they eventually bring you down to what is the ground state. And uh, the energy as a function of the wave function is the expectation value on the Hamiltonian in a Hilbert space, right? So this is not just one dimension, it's a Hilbert space. Let me now see. Now we have to, let me now go back to molecular dynamics. I do one step. My positions change. These positions are going to change slightly. The Hamiltonian changes. Well, this energy as a function of the wave functions will also have a slightly different shape. Not this one, but slightly different. Let me now introduce, I hope you can see that, uh, a third axis, which points inside the blackboard, which is the axis of the nuclear positions. Again, I'm condensing three n coordinates into one, just for the sake of clarity. But they are orthogonal, OK? They go inside the blackboard. Moving by one step means that I'm moving one step in this direction, inside the blackboard. So I'm not going to use a different color, otherwise you're going to miss everything. So now I'm at a different value of R, right? I move my particles, 3n particles. Well, at this point, I will have a slightly different potential as a function of psi, because the Hamiltonian has slightly changed. So it will be something like this, for example. And there will be another minimum. And that minimum will not be exactly the same as the one you found before, right? There will be a slight difference in Hilbert space, right? This point would be the one if the wave function was exactly the same, just translating everything by one delta r. But it's not correct that this is the ground state because the Hamiltonian has likely changed. So the minimum has also changed a little bit. The wave function has to change. So it'll be slightly different in Hilbert space again. Fine. But as you obviously, I mean, as we just discussed, if I started from the previous wave function, that would give me a very good estimate of the minimum because the, the parabola has changed only a little bit. So if I use the previous ground state as the initial point to evaluate the new minimum, I'm going to find the new minimum in a very short time because I'm very close to the, uh, to the new minimum. If I move my delta r by only a small amount, okay? new wave function means the solution of this problem with uh, the new value of uh, r. And of course, I can continue this, and I can continue forever, right? And I can evolve. I can evolve in the direction of R, which is my molecular dynamics trajectory. And every time, I will be able to identify what is the minimum, right? So this curve here will be the curve that will give me the set of instantaneous minima of the wave function when I move my trajectory in time, that is, when I evolve my R, all right? <clears throat> now. Born Oppenheimer dynamics uh, is precisely the set of these points. That is, of every value of uh, r, I find the ground state, and I always choose as a wave function the one that corresponds to the minimum of this uh, parabola, the ground state for a specific value of the position of the particles. Now, the idea of Karen Parinello was to relax uh, this constraint and let the wave function oscillate about the minimum with an harmonic dynamics. So essentially, instead of being always close to the center of this, in the Carpanello method, what you do is you, instead of finding every time the minimum of your uh, potential, you allow your electrons, and these are wave functions, to oscillate and to follow the ground state uh, adiabatically. Now, let me try to show this in a, in a, with a classic analog. You have a, a container, a cup, and you have a ball in the middle, right? And you want to make sure that your ball is always at the bottom of the cup when you move your container. OK, suppose you have a, I mean, a cup, I mean, it's a container. Now, in principle, when you move the cup, Right? If the ball is very fast, uh, 
the ball will always be able to adapt uh, to the minimum. This is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. You have a fast degree of freedom coupled to a slow degree of freedom. If the slow degree of freedom moves uh, slow enough, the fast degree of freedom will always be able to remain at the bottom of this uh, container. Okay? But that means that every time you move the cup, the container, your particle has to, you have to wait until your particle manages with a few oscillations to get down to the, to the bottom. In fact, if you give the particle a little kink and you allow the particle to oscillate, you just can I mean, drag your cup around and the particle will always be more or less oscillating about the ground state. Right? The difference with this approach is that you don't have to wait for the little particle to reach the minimum every time. You can just drag your cup, and as long as the motion of the fast particle, the oscillation is fast, as long as this is fast, you don't need to let the, uh, the small particle to reach the, the bottom of the cup every time. Okay? So this is exactly the spirit of the Carpanel approximation. You never let the electrons go to the ground state, but you let them oscillate while this uh, big container, which is uh, the potential energy surface uh, as a function of the electrons, when you change uh, the position of the nuclei, you just let the electrons go around with the fast dynamics, and they will follow adiabatically the minimum, that is the ground state. They will never be exactly in the ground state, uh, but on average, they will, because if this is oscillating and it is oscillating fast, they will actually, on average, the electrons will always be on average in their ground state. Never instantaneously, but on average they will. Now, the advantage of this, of course, is that you don't have to wait for the fast particle to get to the minimum every time you move the cup. You just let the particle move dynamically, okay? which means this method can actually be much faster than standard methods in which you find the minimum of the uh, you, 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 you impose the Born-Oppenheimer approximation by letting the wave functions go to the minimum. All right, uh, this is just to give you an idea of, uh, this is not the only method, it's one of the most powerful ones to speed up uh, uh, an ab initio molecular dynamics calculation, that is to handle wave functions in, a, in an effective way in order to be able to follow this uh, uh, adiabatic ground state as, uh, I mean, uh, in, a, in a very efficient way, which is what you want, particularly from a computational point of view. Oops, I have about uh, uh, 30 minutes, is that right? Yeah, so uh, I would say I would like to conclude here the lecture, the theoretical lecture. If you don't mind, I will just show you a few examples of my own research on uh, exploring planetary interiors. It's going to be very light, so don't worry too much. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, can I have the... Uh, Screens, or, uh, no, sorry, display. The first, uh, I think it's display, um, yes. Sì, sì, lo, lo, no, va già avanti e indietro, vedo se me lo prendi adesso. Questo. No, questo tu devi cercare i propri schermi. Ma è un Mac, non credo che cerchi lo schermo, dovrebbe trovarlo automaticamente. Display. Detect display. Yes, yes, I think you have to do it. Yeah. Uh, configuration. <coughs> Mm, probably this was not connected. Okay. Ah, see, 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 see. Yeah, okay. Good. I think it was just the connection. <clears throat> okay, good. <clears throat> 
Okay, so this is just going to be a brief journey into the center of planets with uh, Benicio Molecular Dynamics. Uh, and I'm starting with this slide. Uh, sorry, this is a talk I gave recently in, uh, in, at the African University of Science and Technology. Um, I'm starting with this slide just to give you a, a feeling, I mean, something you certainly share, about uh, how little we know about the, uh, even the Earth's interior. We know uh, uh, very little to the extent that, of course, science fiction has been extremely uh, prolific in uh, coming out with... Uh, ideas about uh, 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 the, what could be the shape of the... Uh, I actually like this one because it's recommended for adult entertainment, and I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> All right, so um, this is what we know about the, the interiors of planets. Um, let me also mention that there are a number of uh, thousands of new planets that have been discovered recently which do not belong to the solar system. In the last 10 years, there's been a race... Uh, 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 in, in the discovery of uh, new so-called exoplanets. So uh, we used to be studying this uh, eight or nine planets, uh, so the statistics was very limited, and now we are actually able to understand much more about formation, structure, and properties of planets because we've been, uh, we, we are discovering, a, I mean, almost a one, one new planet per day nowadays uh, belonging to other solar systems, thanks to improve the observational techniques. But anyway, this is uh, uh, three categories of planets that you will certainly find in the, in the solar system. The Earth-like planets, solid. They typically are made of uh, a core uh, made of iron. There's a mantle made of silicates and oxides. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but I just want to sketch some concepts. And then you have the giant planets, Jupiter and, and Saturn, uh, the, 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 the quasi-stars. They are primarily made of hydrogen. And uh, hydrogen, of course, is molecular at ambient conditions, but uh, these are extreme pressure and temperature. So the question is, what's going to happen to hydrogen at those conditions? And it may or may not be a core. We don't know. In fact, uh, uh, these kind of simulations are also helpful because they help constrain densities uh, at those conditions and help uh, planetologists uh, determine whether there is a core, for example. We don't know whether there is a core or not. Needless to say, we know very little from direct information about uh, internal information about these planets. Uh, the uh, closest approach was the Voyager uh, spacecraft, uh, at least in Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, there's, uh, there are new probes being sent, but anyway, they only scratch the surface. They only go see uh, the first uh, 10 or 20 kilometers uh, 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 um, under the, uh, the atmosphere of uh, these planets. No way they can penetrate uh, this. Uh, for the Earth, of course, we know much more, uh, although actually the deepest uh, hole, man-made, artificial hole, is only 15 kilometers. So direct information about the Earth is... Uh, is not direct, is, in, is indirect. It comes primarily from seismic waves. We know a lot about this, the, the Earth thanks to, uh, to seismic waves. And uh, needless to say, there are no, there's no seismicity in planets like Neptune and Jupiter because they are fluid. So we're really left with very little to uh, try and understand what these interiors of planets are made of. If not, uh, say, global densities, for example. We know that Neptune and Uranus are more, much more dense than Jupiter and Saturn implying that their composition must contain uh, not only hydrogen, but in fact in large amounts of water, methane, ammonia, for example, or molecules that were there when the solar system formed. Uh, what makes this uh, understanding complicated is also the fact that when you enter inside these planets, uh, the temperature and pressure also increases dramatically. Uh, for the Earth, uh, we know that the pressure at the center of the Earth is... Uh, about 3,600, uh, uh, sorry, 3,600,000 atmosphere, 3.6 uh, megabars. We know that pressure very well, even though we have never been there, uh, because that's determined by gravitational uh, uh, forces. So as long as you know the density of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, you can easily determine the, de the, the pressure at the center of the Earth. And we know that with an uncertainty of less than 1%. So it's three, three, uh, three, 361 uh, gigapascals, so 3.61 uh, megabars. Uh, we know much less about the temperature inside the Earth. That's actually surprising when I learned it the first time. Uh, we, the uncertainty on the temperature of uh, on the center of the Earth is about 1,000 Kelvin. So it could be 5,000, it could be 6,000, it could be 7,000. There's no way we can determine that, unfortunately, from, from the surface with, uh, with some observation. Even less is known about the other planets. We know, well, the, the, the pressure at the center is uh, reasonably well known, but, but, but temperatures here are, 
are, are uh, much less constrained. For Jupiter, we are talking about 30 megabars, so 30 million atmospheres and temperatures in the range of 20, 30,000 Kelvin. <clears throat> and compositions are here, but again, uh, uh, we think there is water, methane, and ammonia. We are quite sure there is oxides and silicates. We are quite sure there is iron in the earth, although it could be mixed with nickel, as a matter of fact. Uh, we are quite sure about densities in Jupiter and Saturn because uh, hydrogen being the lightest element, uh, the only density that is compatible with Jupiter and Saturn is 90% uh, hydrogen and 10% uh, helium. There's no other possibility given the... Um... So the question, of course, is... Uh, um, given perhaps the compositions, uh, how can we understand the properties of uh, these materials, uh, hydrogen, uh, water, ma ma methane, uh, uh, iron, at those conditions? These are extreme conditions. We're talking about million atmospheres and several thousand Kelvin. Are there phase transitions? Are there phase changes? Are they liquid? Are they solid? There's nothing that can tell us, uh, in principle, by looking at planets, uh, what, is this, what, is the, what are the properties of this material. Let me just give you a very stupid example, you're pretty sure you're all familiar, of something that changes uh, structure and properties under pressure. This is, of course, carbon. Carbon is, uh, uh, goes from graphite, uh, which is a layered substance, into diamond, which is a very hard substance. Uh, and I'm sure, how, I mean, how many of you know what is the most stable phase of carbon at, at ambient conditions? Graphite or diamond? Graphite? Anyone for diamond? No? Good. <laughs> it's actually graphite. And in fact, the reason why it's graphite is obvious. It's because graphite is very abundant. Diamond is not abundant on the Earth's surface. And so thermodynamically, I mean, if diamond was more stable, uh, uh, then it would be much more abundant than it is. In fact, diamond exists on the Earth's surface, and you can find it in mines, because it is produced at pressure the temperature where it becomes thermodynamically stable at about 60 kilometers depth, and then it is brought up to the surface by convection, all right, on geological scales. So diamond actually is not stable at ambient conditions, but it becomes stable uh, as soon as you consider conditions that are only 60, 70 kilometers uh, uh, deep inside the, inside the Earth. By the way, uh, just to, uh, out of curiosity, uh, this is... Uh, uh, this is when, when this was discovered, when people realized that graphite was stable, but diamond could be stabilized by pressure and temperature, there was this uh, huge race across the world to try and synthesize in the lab diamonds by squeezing graphite inside the giant press. And General Electric won this race in '51 and got the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the patent for this. Uh, and actually, General Electric became a very large company, primarily thanks to this uh, patent in '51. Now... <clears throat> 99% of the diamonds at the Earth's surface are artificial diamonds. They're now produced with, uh, with uh, high pressure, high temperature synthesis. Of course, they're very small. The ones that you find in gems, in jewels, are natural diamonds, but they're very rare. And this is why they cost a lot. The other ones are typically small and primarily used in drills. But again, the, uh, 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 the very large majority of diamonds that we know are actually artificial diamonds nowadays. So there is, there is interest in, 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 in high pressure science uh, from the point of view of material science, uh, if we could synthesize new materials. Uh, there is interest also in fundamental physics. I mean, you're all physicists, and, uh, and there is an extremely interesting problem, which is the determination of the phase diagram of hydrogen. Uh, turns out that hydrogen, as I said before, is molecular at ambient conditions, but eventually it should metallize, and this is a very fundamental process. I mean, the simplest element in the periodic table that turns into a metal, and that's something that has not been yet achieved experimentally. I'll show you some, some, some pictures later on about this problem. So how do we achieve high pressures and temperatures in the lab before we even start discussing about computational studies? Well, there are two main methods. Uh, one is uh, shock waves. You take a bullet and you shoot that bullet on top of your sample. You put the sample here and you generate a shock wave. And these shock waves typically reaches pressure and temperature, which are comparable to the one that you can find in planetary interiors. The problem with this technique, of course, is that uh, every shot is essentially blows up the entire apparatus. Uh, so it's extremely expensive. And only a few labs in the world can afford this kind of experiments. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, in the U.S., it's the leading uh, in, the, in Russia as well. A much more uh, affordable, from the point of view of uh, at least the financial uh, uh, in terms of cost, uh, is this diamond anvil, uh, anvil cell technique. You take two diamonds. Diamonds are, well, they're expensive, but if you take small ones, uh, a diamond is the hardest known material. 
So you can place, you can manage to place your sample between the two tips of a diamond. You squeeze the two tips, you put a gasket around it. And in this way, you can actually reach pressures of the order of one megabar, one million atmosphere, in a controlled way, right? <clears throat> and you can keep the sample there for a long time, for weeks or months. Speaking. The difficulty, of course, is that uh, it's very difficult to uh, do experiments because uh, you actually have to get to the sample. Uh, fortunately, diamond is transparent, so you can enter with uh, lasers, but it's very difficult to do other kinds of experiments. So with these techniques, uh, you, uh, you can easily get to uh, these pressures and temperature with shock waves. With diamond anvilser, we're still limited to this range of pressure and temperature, so we're still far from the center of the Earth, although at low temperature, actually it was at the conference last week, and they reported the first observation of uh, room temperature compression up to one terapascal. It was really a big achievement. So low temperature can actually go much higher than that, but you are limited to low temperature. That is the record pressure so far. So computationally, what do you do? I mean, this is what I just explained to you uh, a minute ago. You do molecular dynamics because the system is hot. You're interested in very high temperatures. No quantum effects, typically, at 1,000 Kelvin. You solve Schrodinger equation for the electrons with the approximations I discussed before, and you just realize that the energy you extract as a ground state is the same that you are supposed to use. This is exactly what I was discussing at the blackboard uh, uh, before. And again, just to uh, repeat what I said before, uh, the ab initio molecular dynamics, which is what uh, we do I mean, uh, regularly, is the classical molecular dynamics, because it's Newton's equations, in the potential energy surface generated by electrons in their instantaneous ground state. And I don't need to discuss this further because we, we already discussed it at the blackboard uh, uh, a minute ago. So this is what you see when you uh, um, um, open your uh, trajectories and you visualize them. Um, the comparison, I mean, you can also do this with classical molecular dynamics, but the advantage of initial molecular dynamics is you can see chemical reactions because this is now chemically accurate. You're not bound to the use of a specific potential of interaction, which typically leaves uh, particles unchanged, and you allow your system to really explore the phase space in a true way by exploiting, I mean, uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the, the power of the ab initio description of your potential, and you see, for example, several chemical reactions here. This is actually a mixture of water and methane. It's uh, uh, the main component of uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune, and this is a pressure typical of the interior of Neptune and Uranus. <clears throat> and what you, um, yes, I'm going to describe this in a minute, so I'll just skip it. This is just to give an example. So I'm going to start with water and methane at planetary conditions. Again, Uranus and Neptune, water is the most abundant in terms of molar fractions. Uh, this is a phase diagram of water which you've probably never seen because it extends to pressures and temperature that are not the ones that you typically, that you are familiar with. I'm sure you're familiar with the phase diagram of water at this tiny corner of the, uh, of the pressure and temperature here. Here we are expanding uh, through simulations the, the knowledge of the phase diagram and pressure is uh, here. This is temperature in 1,000 Kelvin. There are solid phases, of course. Uh, and interestingly, there is a phase which is, uh, we found in simulations, it's, uh, as this property of being super ionic, uh, and then it melts. Uh, let me discuss first the melt. Melt is molecular at mild conditions, then it ionizes because water starts to uh, become an ionic fluid. It loses the protons, start to move around, and then finally there is even metallization of water. Water is, uh, of course, an insulator at standard conditions, a very large gap. Uh, yes. Not yet, but it must exist because otherwise there would be nothing else that explains the magnetic field at uh, Uranus and Neptune. You know, magnetic field has to be generated by a metal, by a conductor, and the only possibility for a conductor, at least based on simulation, is uh, water metallization. Oh, but you're talking about 7,000 Kelvin. You would have to bring it down to ambient conditions, I mean, to ambient temperatures. And here, it is not metallic, definitely. Actually, the gap increases when you compress it at, at, at low temperature. OK? So it's only metallic here. You cool it down, it becomes an insulator. 10, 10 12, 12 electron volts gap. So no chance of having a superconductor, unfortunately. Uh, I, think, I think it's a few weeks ago, there is a very high temperature for the Sure. It's, no, it's uh, hydrogen sulfide. There was actually at a conference where it was announced last week. Uh, yes, it's hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen H3S. H3S. But I'll come back to that because that's an interesting point. The, the, the superconductivity there is driven by hydrogen, not by water. 
okay? So it's really hydrogen. So let me just show you briefly the superionic phase that we found in simulations. Uh, uh, so superionic means that it's typically, superionic phases are common in common, are rare, but exist in binary systems. And in this particular case, oxygen sublattice is still a crystal structure, and the protons start to diffuse freely. So the molecule breaks, the oxygen atoms uh, crystallize in a BCC crystal structure, and the protons start to diffuse like if they were in a C. I mean, it's completely fluid as far as the protons are concerned. What you see here is the dynamics of a single proton moving around. There would be, of course, uh, uh, 2n more, where n is the number of blue balls, which we don't see because otherwise it would be impossible to visualize the system. And you see that the proton starts, it starts in the originally here, and then it starts to diffuse around and move around the system. So it's a mixed phase of matter, essentially. I'm going just quickly, just to flash some I mean, nice pictures. And so. uh, uh, of course, uh, Uranus and Neptune have also, in addition to water, they also have methane. And methane, well, planetologists, they say that uh, there is something that originally was methane. We don't know what methane, how methane looks like when you bring it to those conditions, precisely like nobody knew how water would look like when you bring water to those conditions. And there was actually an interesting study with shock waves uh, that uh, we just seen a kink in the equation of state of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 methane. They, they guessed uh, that methane could dissociate uh, at the conditions of uh, Uranus and Neptune. Now, if methane dissociates, it's carbon and hydrogen. And if carbon dissociates, at those conditions, it forms diamonds, right? So, and if diamonds form, diamonds would actually precipitate because they are denser than hydrogen and water and the other substances. So the consequence of this is that uh, Neptune and Uranus could contain a giant mine of diamonds in their core, right? It was actually not, not completely, uh, I mean, um, irrealistic. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, we uh, made some more refined calculations uh, with our molecular dynamics. And what we find is that uh, methane dissociates, but instead of dissociating fully into carbon and hydrogen, actually forms some longer hydrocarbons, uh, uh, like ethane, propane, and butane. And so actually, the picture is a bit more rich than originally thought, although the possibility that there are diamonds in the core of Uranus and Neptune is actually quite uh, high. That is, that the core of these planets might be a giant uh, sphere uh, made of diamond as well as other substances is, uh, is not completely out of the, uh, the picture. Uh, I think short of time. Okay, then let's, let's, let's discuss briefly also mixtures. Uh, in fact, uh, this study we later, I mean, we looked at the two systems separately, methane and water, but of course, inside the planet, these systems are mixed, they're mixed fluid. So we thought we should also look at mixtures, not just at the two systems separately. In fact, there are several reasons to uh, uh, why mixtures are, 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 are interesting, not only for planetary point of view. Uh, if you think about it, methane and water as the prototypical example of hydrophobic interactions. I mean, methane does not like to mix in water at ambient conditions. And why should it mix uh, inside the planets? Uh, there are also other reasons why this is interesting. And for example, another reason is because at low temperature, these kind of mixtures form very interesting compounds known as methane hydrates clathrates. Uh, these are actually believed to be one of the future sources of methane because they are very abundant at the... Uh, in the, in, the deep, uh, in the deep ocean. So we carried out simulations in the mixtures. And here is now, the, uh, again, the same uh, uh, movie I was showing to you before. Let me just, just uh, focus on one aspect here. Uh, these colors here are the protons. Uh, the white and blue uh, balls are the protons. Uh, so this is carbon, and this is water, oxygen. Uh, and, and the color of protons uh, uh, is blue if those protons started originally from a methane molecule, and it's white if those protons originated from a water molecule at the beginning of the simulation. So what you can see here is that protons have completely mixed, uh, and even though the molecules are still vaguely present, as, at least as chemical entities, uh, they've been exchanging their protons continuously to the extent that now the protons are completely mixed. Uh, there are some white ones and blue ones uh, in this methane molecule, for example. So the protons have been really going away around and jumping from one molecule to the other one. On average, however, uh, the molecule is still, I mean, uh, vaguely there as well, both water and, uh, and uh, uh, methane. The interesting thing here is that uh, there is no formation of longer hydrocarbons 
So formation of diamond, which is uh, something that has to start from the formation of carbon-carbon uh, bonds, apparently is not uh, uh, predicted when you put methane into a mixture. So the presence of diamond is actually uh, uh, less, I mean, um, um, uh, likely uh, uh, after we did this simulation. Let me just quickly jump to Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, uh, they are uh, primarily made of, as I said, uh, uh, hydrogen. And so let me now focus briefly on hydrogen. Um, as you probably know, I mean, this is uh, hydrogen at ambient conditions is a very nice uh, molecular system. Uh, H2 is a very stable molecule. But it's actually one of the first, if not the first, uh, um, let me go back to the history here. Yeah, the, uh, the, the first uh, uh, calculation, in quantum mechanical calculation of an extended system, right? Block's theorem had just been introduced. Quantum mechanics had just been introduced. We're talking about 35. The first calculation for an extended system in quantum mechanics was done by U.G. Wigner and Huntington uh, in Princeton at the time. And it involved the possibility that by changing the volume, by changing the size of the cell, Hydrogen, which of course they chose hydrogen because it was the simplest possible system with just one electron, would transform from a molecular phase into a monatomic phase. Okay, and it actually came out with a predicted pressure for that transition. It was 35 kilobars, very low pressure, something you can easily achieve nowadays in the in the lab, if that, of course, uh, uh, had been a correct calculation, which was not. Uh, by the way, from a chemical point of view, sorry for this stupid uh, slide, but uh, 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 I mean, this is equivalent to saying that hydrogen, which at ambient condition actually behaves like a halogen. I don't know why Mendeleev put it in the, on the light, left side of the periodic table. He should have put it on the, on the right side. I mean, it's, it's, also, it's also a correct position because it's one electron less than helium. And definitely, it's property that ambient conditions are much closer to those of the halogens than to those of the alkalis. But as a function of pressure, Huntington and Wigner found that uh, hydrogen essentially starts behaving like, uh, like a standard alkali metal. Now, uh, the, the truth of this statement has in very important implications for planetary science. Because if you consider now Jupiter and Saturn, for course, at the beginning, this is a molecular, at the, in the atmosphere, this is a molecular phase. But when you go deep inside the planet, Definitely, you're going to encounter a transition in which molecular hydrogen breaks down and forms uh, a, monatomic a monatomic fluid, precisely like uh, sodium, potassium, and all the alkalis. Now, there are two questions associated with that. One is at which depth uh, this occurs, because uh, the depth at which it occurs uh, determines where the magnetic field that is observed in Jupiter and Saturn uh, comes from. But even more importantly is whether this transition is or not a first-order phase transition. In the solid, of course, a transition from a molecular state to a monatomic state has to be first order. But in the fluid, well, you don't know. I mean, it's, uh, there, there are examples of first order phase transitions. Take the gas to liquid transition, for example. But they're very rare. I mean, there's only one, as far as I know, gas to fluid. However, if this transition took place in an abrupt way with the first order phase transition, that would correspond to a sharp density change, and that would have enormous uh, implications for, a, for our understanding of, of these planets. Like for the Earth, there is a density jump, but there are reflection of waves, there is a, a discontinuity in thermal conduction. I mean, the, the structure of the planet would be layered instead of being a, a, a uniform body. And that, of course, uh, would change completely our understanding of, uh, of uh, these, these giant planets. So the, the fact whether this takes place in a first order way or not, and this is a dramatic change because you're dissociating the molecule. So we carried out simulations on this some time ago. This is the pair correlation function as a function of uh, pressure for increasing pressure. I didn't mention the pair correlation function. I should have. But anyway, pair correlation function is a very powerful tool to determine the structure of your system when you do molecular dynamics, particularly in a fluid. It is essentially the probability that if you sit on an atom, on a particle, you find another particle at a distance r from yourself. Okay? So if you sit on one proton, on one hydrogen atom, what this is telling us is that there is a very high probability that there is another proton at a distance about uh, point, uh, 75 from yourself, 0.75 angstroms. That, that's exactly the molecular distance. So in fact, in this system here, there is probability one that you have another proton at that distance. In other words, the system is in a fully molecular state. 
because every atom has probability one to have another partner at the distance point, at the distance corresponding to the molecular distance from itself. And then if you go beyond that, you'll find all the other molecules, all the other atoms at longer distances. But the interesting thing is that when you compress this uh, molecular fluid at some point, in fact, uh, there is a question whether this is abrupt enough or not, but in a rather abrupt way, in only a few uh, tens of GPA, uh, this probability becomes uh, a rather constant one, a flat one, implying that uh, there is a probability to find a partner at a given distance, uh, which starts from point eight, but there is no specific peak at one. The molecular peak has completely disappeared. It's equally probable to find a partner, a, a proton at the distance point eight, one, 1.2, 1 1.4, two, or whatever. So the molecule has completely lost uh, its identity. In fact, if you take a snapshot, you'll find this kind of uh, worms uh, uh, percolating through the, uh, the system. The molecular entity is completely disappeared. Now, of course, uh, this is first order. The only problem with this simulation is that this was carried out at a temperature which was much below uh, the temperature of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. There are technical problems in reaching those temperatures. So there is evidence that the transition could be abrupt, it could be first order, but the evidence is only uh, uh, at low temperature for a time being. Uh, I have five minutes, so let me see. Uh, yeah, okay, well, very quickly, also because this touches on the issue of potentials now. So, Earth, I mentioned before the uh, temperature problem. Uh, we don't know the temperature of the Earth, at least in the core. But uh, uh, if you think about it, the core is divided in two parts. One is the inner part is uh, solid, and the outer part is liquid. And they're both liquid iron. Uh, they're both iron. Liquid outside and solid inside, right? I think you're all familiar with this. Now, if you take now the interface between the outer core and the inner core, this is something that is there at the thermodynamic equilibrium since uh, millions of years, right? So the temperature there must be exactly the melting temperature of iron at that pressure, 330 gigapascals, 3.3 megabar. So if we manage to do an experiment here at the surface of the Earth, or if you manage to simulate on a computer and determine the melting temperature of iron at 3.3 megabar, we would know what the temperature is at the center of the Earth. Well, there are corrections due to the fact that the outer core is not pure iron. There are impurities, so it's, there is a little bit of depression of the melting point. But, I mean, to first approximation, this is, a very, this is a correct statement. If you're able to determine the melting temperature of pure iron at 3.3 megabars, you'll be able to tell what the temperature at the center of the Earth is. So we, okay, we try to do molecular dynamic simulations. Um, I just want to mention one thing. Let me skip this. Let me go to this one. This is actually another system, but uh, determining melting temperature turns out to be extremely difficult uh, because it requires very large unit cells. Uh, and as we discussed before, it's a change of phase. So that's not something that you can easily simulate with a simple molecular dynamics uh, simulation. It really requires very large uh, sampling of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the phase space. Something you can uh, typically hardly do with ab initio molecular dynamics. In fact, it, it's almost impossible to determine with ab initio molecular dynamics uh, a melting temperature of a system. This is actually a problem that we faced in several other cases, uh, including, for example, the study of liquid silica, in which uh, we uh, performed uh, this uh, simple experiment, computational experiment to determine the equation of state uh, with a standard classical potential. This is a pair potential. And with ab initio methods, you'll see also the, uh, you know, the noise in the calculation, which means that the calculation was actually very heavy from a computational point of view. And here is the experiment. None of the two was able to reproduce the experimental data, unfortunately. The classical calculation, the red curve, you could achieve statistical accuracy, but of course, from a chemical point of view, the pair potential is not correct. It's not giving the correct interactions. Ab initio molecular dynamics, Chemically, it is correct, but there's not enough time in a simulation to sample the phase space efficiently and therefore to determine a property as simple as, in this case, the volume of a fluid. So there's not enough time. Silica is particularly nasty because the viscosity is very high. So in a standard molecular dynamic simulation, you only see a few jumps of the atoms, not too much. So we came up with this already a few years ago with a technique that essentially uses that information from ab initial trajectories uh, 
to refine the parameters of uh, two, three, four body embedded atom models. Okay? Embedded atom models, the ones that I've shown you before, they contain a large number of parameters. Those parameters are typically extracted based on comparison with experiments. Instead of doing that, we used uh, the ab initio molecular dynamic trajectory to generate uh, the best possible potential at the given pressure and temperature based on information extracted from uh, ab initio. And this is just to show you what we get in terms of uh, agreement with experiments now with this new potential. New potential, which is a classical one, but whose parameters have been determined based on fitting to the ab initio. So it, it, it uh, unifies, it merges into a single potential, the uh, statistical accuracy of a classical potential with the chemical accuracy of the ab initio uh, trajectory. So anyway, to cut the long story short, this is what we get for uh, iron. 5,400 Kelvin, whatever that means. <laughs> and with this, I think I just wanted to uh, uh, um, thank you with this. Oh, sorry, I skipped this. this is, uh, I just was to thank you, and uh, if there is any question, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs>